Excellent. So again, welcome to our 2023 training. Um, we're going to do every Monday, 7.30. We're going to get started right at 7.30. We'll record these, put these up on YouTube. I'll throw them out on the Arbiter. Again, the share drive is going to have all of this info that we share. Um, we'll go through the different documents. The goal is to, uh, A, train you on what you'd like to be trained on, and B, also come up with some different topics that are not necessarily just mechanics or just rules. And so again, we're gonna do different things like managing crews. A couple of people from the quiz asked about coaches. We already have that in the plans of how do we disarm coaches. We also have uh, moving up was one of the ones and how to get observed and how to take constructive criticism and apply that. So we have a lot of different topics to go over. Um, again, we're going to condense them the best we can in a very small format. Tonight is going to be that example of that. We're going to spend about five minutes on the NCAA faceoff versus the NFHS. We are then going to go through the differences of NFHS versus NCAA, again, with a focus on NCAA. The goal or the, the method we're gonna use is I'm gonna go through my pregame as if I was the R in an NCAA game. And so that way it gives you an idea of what I would actually spend time on, especially if, since we all have been there, sometimes we get a five minute pregame, sometimes we get a 20 minute, sometimes we get an hour. And so again, being able to condense all of that down the best we can and then we're going to allow to go through our rules document change sheet, again, that we gave. A lot of you asked for that. We have that available. I'll resend that link tomorrow. And then we're going to open it up for Q&As. But what we're going to do as well is we're essentially going to end the webinar. We'll take the recording off. And then if you have questions, throw them in the chat. And we, John and I will be here until the last person leaves, but the key is we're going to do everything in a training area and then allow for questions afterwards. So if you feel that you want to jump off or if you have other things going on or you're running back from a game or family stuff, we want to be super valuable of your time, if that makes sense. Um, so again, if you have questions, throw them in the chat. John is going to catalog them and put them in. He's unmuted as well. So if there's something super pressing that he knows that we're not going to cover, he's going to interrupt me. Sound good on format, everything like that. So I appreciate you again for jumping on. Um, the biggest thing that we are going to talk about in terms of changes is that a lot of people are worried about, or I said the biggest thing that people are worried about, and I'm going to share my screen. We can get this going. If I can get my PDF to share, then we are in business. Optimize in there. And so, and I just give me half a second here. We can throw you back. Everybody disappears when I share a screen and then I feel like I'm by myself talking to myself, which is normal, but I at least like some confirmation that I'm crazy. And so this is the two man mechanic in terms of our face offs, right? And as we, John and I spent a lot of time going through the face-offs manual, hasn't been updated by US Lacrosse since 2021. So we went through them and made edits to the actual manual and put all of our edits in blue. The face-off has the most by far. And again, we'll make this available, but it's a good brush up on different things. In a two-man game, we have a wing official who's lead left and we have a face-off official. It's kind of simple. The face-off in terms of what it is, and there's a lot of stuff, is not different NCAA comparably over to the NCAA. It's the same exact face-off. We're gonna get to our spot, hopefully within 20 seconds of the goal being scored, we put our signal up, tweet, tweet, tweet. We're gonna jog at the very least. If we are in a three-man crew in NCAA, the, per, the lead official, the person who just called the goal is bringing the ball and now becomes the face-off official. In a two-man game, we're going to toss the ball underhand, one toss, or we're going to run it up to our partner in that scenario. All of this should be occurring in 20 seconds. So we need a jog. This is the biggest time saver that we can have. It's also the biggest hustle play that everybody will go off of as well. In that scenario, start putting your timer on as the wing official. I, I, it's the same thing I said in the clinic. If we do it on the first or second, there's a delay of game and we point the other way, that's the last delay of game you're going to have for the entire day. And your entire game is going to spend be 10, 15, 20 minutes sooner than if you were spending a minute, two minutes on each face off. We're going to put the ball down. Again, some of you write in a scorecard by rule, you have to. I, I don't. So again, I just give that mechanic. We're going to look for a wing official again. He's going to have his beeper on. He's going to have the stop signal. He's going to point nice and straight. 
nothing out of 45 where we have no idea what this is, straight up or straight out. It's either up or 90, that's it. Once we then have that, we're gonna instruct the players to go down. Same face off mechanic, regardless of NCAA or NFHS, we're looking for 8,000 things. At some point, you have to give up one of those things. And again, we don't want you to, but even if you're in a three-man mechanic, meaning two people are on the face-off, a helper and the single who's con conducting the face-off, at some point, you're not going to be visible to see all these things. You're either going to miss the neutral zone, you're going to miss the lean, you're going to miss the backhand. We need to watch for the best we can. And again, my method, change what you're looking for each time. Sometimes, if you know a guy, the new way of doing it, they're keeping that backhand off of the ground so they can leverage the head. That's what they're doing. So you can get a pre-pinch on the stick because you can make one quick move and plunge her out that way. So now you're seeing that backhand is not touching. You're seeing less leans because it's not as effective, right? So if you change where you are and you look at different things, you're eventually gonna come around full circle and look for everything at least once. In terms of that, if we're in the NFHS, we are allowed to make verbal adjustments. I urge you not to make physical adjustments if you can't. We shouldn't be touching players. That's my big item. Only thing we should touch is helmets and bolt together if we move them out in the neutral zone. Outside of that, we can verbally adjust them, clear and concise commands. In NCAA, we do not adjust them. If they are both slightly on the plastic, we are, we're good to go. If they're slightly leaning, we're good to go. If one is massively egregious versus the other, that's now a violation. We can understand those subtle differences, right? Once we feel we're good in an NFHS, we're going to say set and back out with the whistle in our mouth, and we're going to blow that whistle, right? Quick, quick, quick. Vary your cadence. Don't try to catch them. In an NCAA, this is the massive difference to the NFHS, and that is basically the only difference that occurs in this scenario. In the NCAA face-off, you must be stationary when you say set. That goes for all three officials. They felt that our movement was distracting the face-off guys, so they asked us to be stationary. So that means if you wanna look over the top of face-off, do it very quickly. After you say down, take a step back, then your set, then your whistle. It's stationary. The entire rest of the face-off is the same. Outside of, you're stationary and we don't make adjustments. Once that whistle goes, we're live. Now we're looking for all of our regular things. Jumps are the number one thing. Holds are number two. Number three is that ball not popping out. And then bonus of four and five, kicking of the cross or a double clamp which seems to be occurring more often this year because the first move has to be over the ball. And if it's not, then you can't clamp again if you miss that opportunity. Outside of those five things, we have, especially our, our college guys know it, we have a ground ball scrum 50-50, three on three, almost every time. It is happening a lot this year. That's what they wanted. That's fine. Now you need to be aware of where the wing guys are and you need to be safe. Get to a spot and get safe. If there is a violation on the faceoff, this is our third NCAA difference, we count violations per team per half. If we hit three per team per half, now we have a technical foul 30 second time serving flag. At the beginning of the second half, it resets. And I just found this out, beginning of overtime it resets and then it goes for all overtimes is considered one half of play. So it resets in the first quarter, in the third quarter, and in the first overtime, that count resets. In terms of face-offs, exact same thing we've been doing last year, same thing we're doing this year, right? Place the ball down, tell them to go down, look for anything, say set, blow your whistle. That's it. Simple process, ton of language and verbiage going on with all those different things, right? And we need to be aware of that make sure we get somebody else in here. And so we need to be aware of all of these different things, right? But at the heart of it, it's the same exact face off it's been. We're just not touching the players. We're spending a little bit of difference. And in the NCAA, we're stationary, right? We're not adjusting. And we have three violations per team per half. I'm gonna say that one more time. Our big difference, right, is that we're stationary. 
We are not adjusting and we have three violations per team per half. That's it. So all of the big items and all everybody seems to be all out of sorts with the NCAA versus NFHS. Same face off we've been doing. So we break it down to those simple things for you. So as we move, perfect 742, we are on time. We are going to move and we're going to make this available, all of these sheets for you. Bernard, just give me a thumbs up. Did we switch over to our three person crew? Or are we still on shared at something else? Okay, there we go. Do I have three person crew sharing? Three person, yep, yep. Okay, perfect. Just to make sure. All right, so we're gonna share this with you. I'm gonna spend the next less than 10 minutes going through, again, for anybody joined in late, if you have questions, throw them in the chat. After this 10 minute portion, we'll get to a Q&A. In terms of our major differences, we have an entire sheet. We're gonna go through those momentarily. But in terms of our big things, what I always do is a pregame, and anybody who's worked a game, regardless of who is the R or the crew chief, if we're working a two or three man game, the first thing I like to go through is remember what game we're doing, right? I talk about this all the time. A lot of us go to different games in different days, and so we understand that sometimes we're at a 10U game, and then we go to an NFHS, and then we go to an NCAA game. And some of you, I just talked to two of you today, some of you are doing different sports on the same day. <laughs> and that happens. So we have to understand what game we're doing, right? And what rule set we're working with. So this is where our partners come in. So as we go through these, again, I'm going to bring you to the, the pregame. We're going to go through each one of these. The really big ones are the ones at the top here, right? Is kind of page one. The first thing is going to be clearing counts. We're going to count those face-off violations. The lie ball timeout is going to be a big one. In the NCAA, we have to be past the restraining line with possession or in a dead ball on the not in the field to play, right? We're also going to have a scenario where the goalies do not get five seconds. We're going to allow a second flag to continue. And then also within the illegal cross area, we're going to have a one minute and a three minute still instead of just the two minutes for everything. And then the last item is going to be the fact that we have a dive in some scenarios. Not every prep school plays a dive. You need to ask the coaches what they're playing sometimes. We also have to see what the field is. If we don't have a goal mouth, we're going to have a little bit of a scenario and probably not play a dive for that day because we feel it's not in the best scenario to be start playing rule sets from five or six years ago and being selective, right? So we need to understand what we're doing. So as we go through those, right, we need to kind of start thinking about what we should be doing as a crew. So I'll kind of bring you through my pregame, right? And this administrative side is everything we're doing normally. Again, we just have a three-man crew versus a two-man in most NCAA rule games. I understand there's JV games and thirds. It's two-mans. We run it as a regular two-man mechanic, and that's fine. The bigger difference is we're going to just have six balls on the sideline. Most teams have more, more than that anyway. We're going to ask about shot clocks. Again, in NCAA, we have a shot clock scenario, right? So do we see it before we even get to the field? That's going to be the big key. Again, as we go through face-offs, it's those three differences. So remind your crew, right? We're going to be stationary. I'm going to say it 15 different times tonight, as I already did. We're going to be stationary. We're not going to adjust. We're going to count violations. Those are our three big ones, right? Then we get to move on. In terms of that three-man crew, there's a lot of different ideas of where to go. Go where you feel comfortable. If you want to change where you are, great. I like staying at a 45. I'm super comfortable there and I feel most safe there. So that's important to me. I don't want to get hit. I got hit a lot last year. It just happened, right? And so again, I want to find a place that I'm safe. Your partner should also figure out to find a different angle. Generally, it happens organically. It was funny, uh, John Vernon asked two of us and we both gave polar opposite answers of should it be the R or should it be the wing guy, which is okay, right? And then, so the real answer is it kind of happens organically. If you see you have the same view as your partner, move your angle, right? That's it. 
if one of you wants to go into 50, you want to go 45, you want to do the Maddie Palum, which is like 12, 15 o'clock, right? Or 1230 o'clock, do that. Do whatever you feel most comfortable, get different views. It's okay to move throughout. I felt it was distracting to be on the 50 because all I was thinking about was, was the lead, right? And I stopped looking for everything else. So again, wherever you're most comfortable, I like being closer. Some guys like being further away. That is totally fine. And again, I would instruct my crew in a pregame, go where you're comfortable and organically we'll move and we'll know your tendencies. If you have a tendency, let's talk about it right now. In terms of where we're going, this is all pretty basic mechanics, but as I go over, lead, make sure you're just getting to GLE as soon as you can, right? If it is a clear scenario, lead, get down there, start backpedaling, you need to see the whole field, right? Watch some subs, listen for a timeout, get to GLE. That's kind of our goal. You need to get the goal if the offense gets down there. Watch for a 10-man ride. That's the new thing, right? Goalies and defensemen like to shoot because in a 10-man ride, meaning the goalie is acting as a field player in terms of defensive coverage, we might have a shot. We might need to get there. If we're mobily challenged, get closer to the GLE. It's okay. It's totally okay, right? Just give yourself time and space to get over there. In terms of the same thing, when we get to the trail, especially in a three-man, your job is to clean everything up. Once the ball gets settled, you have the zone all the way from the back end line all the way to the restraining line. That's all you. Stop at the back pylon. I see it all the time. Don't run past that. Sit at that pylon. Make it a point. Is Even if you talk or you don't talk, the coaches noticed it. I had a game last week, and the assistant coach said, I counted. There has been three pylon stops at this pylon for the entire game. Dick Naramore was at me at that game. He was doing timing. He knows that the very the style of the game was a very choppy game, right? But the assistant coach was marking down the opportunities that he had as an assistant to clarify anything with the official because he felt like nobody wanted to talk to him and everybody was ignoring him. They notice, right? By rule, we don't have to talk to the assistant, but how nice is it that you can gain that ally where he might just have a question, sir, how many timeouts do we have? Give them the answer. Be polite. Because when you need them to back the guys up or to gain control of his guys or to get somebody who's hot out of the way of you, that's when you need them. So just stopping in that pylon is such an important thing for the coaches, for your partners, and the game management itself, if you're watching those subs and things like that. As a single official, you're doing the most running. That's okay, right? The big key is you want to get to the center pylon, and then you want to move on down, right? The big key is to also get all those sideline calls. And again, you're going to be on a little bit of an island sometimes on those calls. You're going to have plays on that sideline where you're going to need to throw a flag, right? Because you can't pass on everything when you're over there because you don't have a second set of eyes. So it's okay if you see something. And again, that Bermuda Triangle idea is when the play is in the neutral zone, right? That is when we need to all be aware. They call it the Bermuda Triangle right here. We're allowed to have multiple flags here. We have multiple eyes on that play. And if it's a clear, it's a ride, we're going to see that. And that's okay. Same thing on the crease is we talked exclusively a lot in the past and now about the dive is that essentially we don't have a goal mouth. We shouldn't be playing dive. It should be that simple. In an, in an NCAA regulated game in here in the state of Connecticut, that simple. If they don't have a goal mouth, they don't paint it, they don't want to do it shouldn't be playing dive. We will try to clarify with the different leagues, but as of right now, that's the rule. The goal mouth has been in for several years, so it should be what we're doing in terms of that. It gets very messy and a very large potential for injury if we're not calling it correctly, right? In terms of that crease, if the player lands in the crease and not the goal mouth, in a legal dive, we have a good goal. He lands in the goal mouth, we have no goal, except we have two exceptions to that. The first one is in a good path in the legal contact. And the second one is what it's the Binghamton play. It was what is now known as the dead ball blow up. The person scores a goal. They're standing on the crease, three Mississippi, four Mississippi smash. They hit the player so hard. He flies five yards into the goal mouth, sir. He's in the goal mouth. What happened? That player is going for two minutes, non-releasable every time at minimum, if not three minutes on that play. They want that play out. In that scenario, the goal still counts with it. So again, remember path, we're gonna officiate 
the crease play the same way we have. It's path, path, path. If they take a good path and they land in the crease, we're good. If they land in the goal mouth, no good. And we can have various different penalties on both offense and defense, depending on what happens from there. In terms of over and back, once we're under 60 seconds on the shot clock, we should be yelling under as a crew, especially to the trail. And now we're on. Anything 60 seconds or under, we have over and back, except for a shot and except if the defense is the last to tip it over, right? So if we have tipped or deflected and defense lands it over, there is no over and back in the first 80 seconds to 61 seconds. They can go back and forth as many times as they like. Screens are generally the same. High hits and late hits. We talked a little bit about in the clinic. We didn't go that far. Is that it should be an indirect hit, a direct hit, and an excessive hit. If we are getting head contact or neck contact on one of those fouls, these are the lock-in scenarios that we're adding. We can still have run of the mill, cross checks and slashes and hits, right? But if this is to the head and neck, we feel it is indirect, meaning a run of the mill, but he hit him in the head, a cross check that rides up into the neck area, that's a one minute non-releasable. A two minute is a head to head contact direct first point of impact like we see almost in the NFL when they say that direct impact, right? Excessive or flagrant, those we're talking potential ejection within those. Same thing on restarts, just calm them down. Don't have them running. Try to put them in the right spot. The more often you do it, it's just like everything else. You do it on the first or second play of the game. You tell them to run back to the pylon. They're going to go close to the pylon every time for you, right? In terms of the shot clock, I think very simple. I feel like we have a tendency to over-explain this, especially for the shot clock operator. There's two signals, and that is it. Just two signals. We have an 80, which is a pump, and we have 60, that's a twirl. All you need to tell the shot clock operator is, what is this? And what is this? And if they answer correctly, you say, awesome. All you have to do is watch us because all three people should be doing that symbol at all times when it occurs. And that's it. We should be watching the trail. They shouldn't be worrying about if it hit a post or not. They shouldn't be worried about resets because we are the ones, our crew is the one who makes the call. That's it. You don't have to listen to coaches. You just have to watch us. We either do an 80 or we do a 60. The only other scenario you want to instruct them is on a face-off that game clock starts, but they hold the shot clock until we have possession. Tell them that's a wind. You're going to see that big wind, right? And those are the three things you can tell your shot clock operator, and it's pretty straightforward. And they've done a really good job at all levels, right, with that, and they understand that. So again, within that, we want an 80 or a 60, right? If it hits the goalie or the pipe, I always laugh on a goal scored. A goal scored, we're having a face off and it's going to reset to 80 anyway, but they wrote it in there. Same thing on the sticks. In terms of all the measurements and the tests, we're doing the same thing as the NFHS. In terms of if it is our, the officials stick check, we are just doing stick check. If we are doing a coach's request, we're doing a full equipment check. Little small nuance to that, right? Goodies is the same. Game management is the same. Final checklists we can go through and do our things, right? And again, and they're just our reminders. You might go through that. And what I generally do is I go back to those five differences or uh, more than that, but I go back to our differences. We don't have clearing counts. We have an 80 and a 60. Face off violations, we count. We're also stationary. And we don't adjust. Told you I was going to get my 15 in there. The lie ball timeout, make sure they are behind or, excuse me, underneath the restraining line. They have to be past that restraining line and have possession on the dead ball timeout. It cannot be on a loose ball technical, something in the field of play. If it's an out of bounds scenario, we can call timeout. Um, technically, the offense can throw it one time anywhere in the attack area. You don't have to get crazy about it, right? NFHS, you just start laterally, but by rule, they can throw one pass, right? No grace period, right? You allow the second flag to continue. Again, one minute for any deep pocket, three minutes for any other cross violation. We also have, again, 
The crease and the goal mouth are in play in NCAA and NFHS. We do not have diving, so we don't have it. We do not have a, this might be in the way for you, it is for me at least. We do not have any kind of goal differential mercy rule in the NCAA. That does not exist. Again, our random inspections are only the cross unless the coach requests it, right? As we can kind of, as we kind of go through these, these are going to get a little bit more in terms of what we don't see, right? Again, anything from that warding, that bulldodge can occur. The contact of the, the head or neck area is going to be locked in, but a one, two, or three minute, depending on what definition we give it. We're also going to have, again, no defensive player because we have our one, two, or three minute directs. We also don't have stalling within that. In the event, if there's not a shot clock, I believe we're going to put on the shot clock mechanic in terms of we are going to instruct the team instead of saying, get it in, keep it in. We're going to go, go our 30 second shot clock. We're going to put our 20 second beep. Or excuse me. We're not even going to do beep. We're going to go right off the scoreboard. John's going to look at me like we already talked about this today. And I, now I remember we're going to go straight off the scoreboard. We're going to try to pick a zero and that's it. So again, if it is at 12, or that's a bad example, 11, 10, we feel they're stalling, right? We're going to say 10, 40, 10, 40, 10, 40 is when it's going to go. And we're going to use the scoreboard for that, right? Again, eye shade in the NCAA is legal. And then again, you get into a lot of smaller ones that again, for time's sake, I am not going to go through on purpose. We're going to make this document available. These are all the actual differences. Uh, John spent a great deal of time doing that, and I can't thank him enough, but there is a lot of them. Most of these from page three or four, you're not going to see, or they're not going to be meaningful. Page two is close. You're not going to see a lot of them. Page one are your, are your pregames of what we should talk about each time. So with that said, we are at 759. Again, we gave different examples. What I'm going to do, and John is right, I ran over time. I'm very used to that being wrong here. But essentially, what we're going to do is we're going to spend an extra 10 minutes, go through these examples. We're going to unmute you so that way you can talk. But if you feel that you want to jump off, be my guest. That's totally fine. Again, we want to be respectful of your time. So the official webinar and now, then we'll meet next Monday on a different topic. We'll go through these. And then if we had any questions in the chat, we'll also do that. Sound good? So if you're leaving us, thanks for being on tonight. And if you're staying, you got to hear me more. Give me two seconds, Dick. Let me just do this. All right, you should be able to unmute. Go ahead, Dick. You're going to keep recording, Rob, or are you going to stop the recording here? I think we can pause for this part until we go to the questions. Thanks, Brother Dave. Um, so again, just to go through these, we'll spend about 10 more minutes or so. If anybody wants to jump in or if you want to talk amongst yourselves or things like that, that's fine. John came up with eight of these questions. We'll go through them. So I'll let you read it. You're going to put that up on the screen? Yeah, I should probably share my screen. That would probably help. I'm looking right at it. <laughs> Each one of these, there is a rules difference. There's eight of these. So what you want to be thinking about is what would the rule be under NCA? What would the rule be under NFHS? If anybody wants to try and take a stab, be my guest. Well, for Federation, federation, it would be a, an immediate whistle unless there was a, a potential shot and then NCAA, nothing. He can do it. Well, in Federation, you give the goalie five seconds to get back. 
don't forget that part of it. Yeah. Is, is the goalie involved in this play? In this scenario, he's holding the ball when the whistle blows, right? 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 Now team A is called for offside. A1 is the goalie, so he drops the ball, right? That goalie's involved in that play, right? So we're given an NFHS, we're given five seconds. In NCAA? <clears throat> quick restart. Quick restart. Quick, quick restart. Now, because Bernan likes throwing 13 different levels into the souffle <laughs> here, right? Now we have the scenario of A2 steps into the crease. What do we have? NFHS, you have an immediate whistle. Immediate whistle, and, right? We're and, assuming in the scenario that there is no immediate, the shot is not in flight in this scenario, right? Correct. So we immediate and, whistle. NCAA continue keep going. play. Yep, we continue, right? And in the NFHS, we're sending that player off for 30. Right. Again, we're counting as that as team violation one on the second violation. It is a releasable on sports and light conduct for that second player. Regardless that it's the first defense they made. Okay, so, so Rob, I'm the coach and I complain that the rule was not properly followed and the goalkeeper was entitled to five seconds to get back and that that error is correctable. So. Are you team A or team B? I'm, I'm team A. <laughs> so I think you got to fix it. I think you got to wipe out the goal. And I think you won't penalize the defender for going in. And I think you redo the restart. I think you got to fix it all because it's correctable. But it's good that we went through the whole thing here so that we reviewed it in case the restart was okay. And um, then you definitely would be penalizing that defender for stepping in. And in that scenario, I, this is where, again, the partnership needs to be strong of if you realize that that is not a five second that the goalie got and you're the, the new trail, blow it dead. Help your partner out as a lead because there's a lot going on, right? They saw a side of play, be saying, I'm ready, I'm ready, right? They might blow really quickly. And if you can recognize that, you can bail everybody out in that scenario, right? Of no, 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 no. My time. Hey. Did you get five seconds or not? I didn't see. Was that a full five you gave your, with your counting <laughs> arm? Or was it a three? Was it a four? Like, and you just buy yourselves time, right? And then John goes, uh, yeah, Rob, I'm always right. And I go, yeah, I blew it early, right? And then fix it. Fix that play. Because in that scenario, the, the what you don't want to do is throw a delay a game on the goalie. You don't want it, that defenseman getting hit by a shot, right? All because we can, we can correct it. Bob? Unmute, Bob. Okay. You're playing NCAA rules. Goalie crosses midfield. You call the offsides. The goalie acts in a fashion where you have a delay of game on his part. You call the delay of game on the goalie. Would the yep. in-home or the goalie serve the 30 seconds? In all, both NFHS and NCAA, the goalie is serving all penalties. In well, youth... We are going to ask, and this is uh, Dick Naramore's point two, our designated defender, right? So that way we just solve that problem before we even get there. But in NFHS and NCAA, they serve all penalties. Great okay. question. I didn't know the college rule. Yep, you're okay. All right. Next one, I'll read it for you. B1 cross checks A1 in the back, and the stick rides up into B1's neck. What is the penalty for NFHS? What is the penalty for NCAA? Yeah, call it a loose ball push. <laughs> Since we're recorded, I have to go, Todd. It was deliberately written as a cross check, so there'd be no confusion that it could be a push. And, That's and in why real life, I go, I go Todd, push. we'd go hold. <laughs> It's a cross check push. So. <laughs> I'd go two right. minutes, lock them in for both. Right. Depending on the severity, right? Yeah. Depending on the severity, we could have if it simply rides up. We have seen this a lot in the in the NCAA game. We could have a one minute that's routine, a one minute locked. Right. A one minute locked. It could also be a two minute. Al is not incorrect right. in that. And NFHS, again, remember our we have a tougher line to draw, right? We either have a one minute releasable or, or we have two. a two, 
or two minute locked, right? It jumps. We can do a two minute releasable as well. But again, remember we have a little bit of a line with head and neck, right? So we're not saying to not call the two minute, right? But realize the context of the game is my only comment I would make to that. Realize the context and try to see what the intention was. Was it a cross check that started here and rode here, right? Or was it a cross check that started here and rode here? We have, hey, it's, it's different. Go ahead, Al. Hey, Rob. You know, um, the games that I've been watching, in particular the, the Cornell Yale this weekend, uh, we did that little Cheshire um, thing yesterday. A lot of times what we're finding is you're seeing kids roll dodging and the defender is ready to play him. You know, he's going to stick his stick out and that yeah. rides up his back because as they roll dodge, they're ducking too, you know? So that stick is riding up the back. What are we going to call? And we got to become uniformly uh, on calls with this because sometimes it does look pretty vicious, but it is just a roll dodge. And that guy is just, you know, he rides up the kid's back. Um, Go ahead, Todd. Yeah. So in the rule book, it states that if a player uh, dodges or moves in a way that what started out to be a legal check now becomes an illegal check, mm -hmm. there is no penalty. If he rolls into it, <clears throat> he rolled into it. And yeah, he's that. not really rolling into it as, as opposed to rolling. You know what I mean? And then, yeah. Just by the, the motion of him rolling, the, the defender's stick is going to ride right up the back into the neck. And, and to so, that point, I, I always steal Steve's line of it's, it's very tough to put into black and white a dynamic play, right? It's a super yeah. dynamic game. Of, and again, and I don't disagree with you. I wish there was because then Bern and I would stop calling each other 14 times a day trying to discuss <laughs> all these scenarios, right? <laughs> but it's, it's to that and, and that serious point of it's tough, right? Because what is the exact action going on? Did he roll and then get hit directly in the face? Did he roll and did it ride? Like I said, did it ride here? Did it ride here? Right, right. The guy's back. Yeah. Right. So, and and go, go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Rob. You're good. Well, good. I found the the way to kind of handle that is um, when you finally see it, and it's evident that everybody sees it. You got to go talk to the coach. It's like, hey, coach. You know, we have the indirect and direct rule understanding. This kid's rolling, but your player's stick is ending up in the kid's neck. You know, we, we, at some point, we, we gotta we gotta take control of that. You know? Yeah, and I and I agree, and I think that that becomes the game management. To your point, in the game you and I worked the other day, we said that, right? We said, and I used right. the Etikel line of, "Hey, we're, we're tightening the screws now, right? Yeah. Now this is the moment, right? And again, it's not a hard line. It's not like the next time we see anybody touch a blade of grass, we're thrown fifteen flat, right? But right. I think it's a good learning point of mm -hmm. sometimes you get to that point if you've seen one or two of those plays that Al just described that are borderline, and we can go fifty fifty, and maybe if we passed on two or three of them. Maybe we say, we're not going to pass from here on out, right? We're not going to change the level of which we're calling from nothing to everything, right? But as the game ramps, you might get a little bit tighter in your calls as well and elevate your calls in a little bit of an upward trajectory, right? Rob, Super you, awesome point. You just go back to two for just one second. I just yeah, want to make one comment on that. The intent of that particular question was just to let you guys know that the cross check that comes up and hits him in the head or the neck can be is one minute non-releasable for indirect for NCA. And if it's a real cross check and it's a follow through that goes up into the head or neck, it's two minutes non-releasable for NFHS. So I was just trying to create a distinction between the two rule sets um, where the same exact play could be one non-releasable in NCA <clears throat> and two non-releasable in NFHS. So that was the intent of the question. Yep. Peace. All right. So three, we got A1 with possession and both hands on the cross, uses a forearm to direct B1's body. So forearm, body away from him in a non-violent manner. A1 creates space and B1 falls to the ground. Is it legal or illegal? NFHS and NCAA. NFHS, illegal. What's the call? B1's got big feet. Warding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a ward if it's, it's a ward if it, both. In that case, it's a ward if because of the word nonviolent. If it was violent, you could go unnecessary. Yep. Yep. 
And remember, we can have that bull dodge in NCAA, right? <clears throat> but we can still have personal fouls if we feel to that point, right? So I saw that the other day. We can, have, Yeah, we can have an unnecessary. If he leaves with the helmet is one of my, I hate to say it, it's one of my favorite calls to make. It sh I should never have to make it, right? But that attackman who leads with the helmet and, yep. and hits, call yep. it on the attackman, yep. right? Yep. If, if we got to get it out of the game, we just want less helmet hits. That's it. We want players safer, right? And the best way to call, call on the attackman looks at you, go, oh, sir, goodbye. We don't want that hit. <clears throat> Could it be at all, at any time, the guy with the ball does a bull dodge and runs a little guy over? I mean, a big guy just runs over the little guy. Could he be held for uh, unnecessary roughness? Yeah. yeah any personal offensive, foul. I'm talking the offensive player. Yep. He just, yep. He's just going to run through a guy. You know what yeah. I mean? Correct. And there's a difference that that's the age old argument. There's a difference from a size matchup, right? If the guy runs sure. normally and the little guy flies because of size are different than that big guy is really, and I don't want to use it, but kind of targeting and really that's crushing right. that little guy for the sake of crushing him too different, right? We're judging intent there and we want to go through those. Yeah, Sheldon. Yeah. I think Rob in that instance, if I see the big guy drop his shoulder, he's targeting the little guy. And but remember, you have key. no, you also have no target in NCAA. Yeah, but if he drops his shoulder, he's going to run over the kid. And that's Correct. His intent. But just, just we can't call a target in NCAA. Right, but we can call unnecessary because. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yep, we can do a one or a two. We could do a two. We had that the other day. We called a two-minute unnecessary because the guy drilled him in the chest with the shoulder perfectly legal hit but we felt was very late like a good one mississippi and a half and just absolutely killed the dude and we just felt it was unnecessary right and all three of us looked at you go that was just unnecessary we go, there's our answer right like you know what i mean and so move brooks you got some yeah rob um actually it was on two so sorry i tried to get in for two and three go but ahead. if anyone else has anything on three you can finish three my question was just in on in NFHS, is it for personal fouls one minute or always? Um, not one, or, two, or what? three. And then if we have targeting or defensive player, we have two minute or three minute locked in and are non releasable. Great. So my question was can you lock in a one minute in NFHS? NFHS for anything, or is one minute personal foul typically always releasable? If it's no, like a we, personal foul, not a yeah. sportsman like. If we go, whoop, whoop, whoop. remember when we're head and neck, John, page one, page two. Um, it's you either need defenseless, right, yeah. or a head and neck. And so in that scenario, we have two or three, so we have no one minute locks in in the NFHS for a cross check or for all person anything except anything on besides on sports and light conduct there is no one minute locked in it or just doesn't exist or so, and, yeah or so a legal body check unnecessary roughness if you're locking it in it's because Ooh. it was higher higher violence it's got to be up either defenseless or a head and neck okay and then you're in a two or three and you are locked in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Defenseless, okay. a target, that kind of thing. Thank you for Andy? clarifying. Yeah, of course. Andy? I was just going to say, guys, remember that if you see a play and you cringe internally, throw a flag. Figure it out after that. Mm -hmm. That's why I tell the new guys. Yeah. <clears throat> if that play you makes you go, ooh, or ooh, that looks terrible. <laughs> Just throw the flag, and then you can always pick up the flag and wave it off if you have to, after you talk to your partner. But Yep, good point. All right, so for four, we have a loose ball in Team B's goal area. B1 put loose ball, B1 pushes A1, play on. Official blows the whistle to end the play on while the ball is still in the goal area. Where does the restart go? This is just a question about the restart. 
NFHS. Where lateral. do we have to go? Outside. Lateral. Lateral, lateral. Yeah, outside the goal area on both sides. In sets. NCAA, by rule, where anywhere can they go? Outside, anywhere outside the goal area. Anywhere, including one pass can be made to make that occur. Right. They can either run it out, or that one player, run it out of the area to a specific spot outside the area or one pass. Yeah. Good, good, good. Five. A1 has possession when A2 is called for offside. Before the restart, Team A, which still has one timeout left, thank you for that clarification, calls timeout to prevent TB, Team B from getting a fast break. Legal or illegal? Let's start NFHS first. No, it's a fast restart that's... Uh... Oh, Todd, Todd, you're, is it NCAA or NFHS? Which one are you Federa answering? Federation, NFHS. Uh, fast restart that's that's um, benefiting Team B is, is getting possession. Team A does not have the right to call. In NFHS, where can we call live ball timeouts in NFHS? Anywhere. Or dead balls. Or excuse me, dead ball timeouts because it's a dead ball. Anywhere. Any dead anywhere, any anywhere, anytime in any NFHS. Correct. I had, well. <laughs> I had this wrong as well. Don't feel bad. I got this wrong as well. I totally got this wrong because I thought it was the same, but it's not. And so in that scenario in high school, they can kill the fast break. Any dead ball anywhere they can call oh, it. In NCAA, right? It's within the field of play. They are entitled to that quick restart. <clears throat> Todd is 100% correct. And I am correct because I got this wrong too. Don't, don't worry. <laughs> And so, and so again, that quick restart is pending. You're allowed. Make sense? Good, 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 good. All right, six. A1 with possession in its defensive half of the field is slashed by B1. Flag down. The ball is loose. <laughs> B2 then pushes A1. So there's... Ooh, Second foul. Second foul. Second foul. Continuation. Second flag. Second foul. Whistle and federation. Stops in high school. Yeah, it stops at right. high school. What do we do in NCAA? Yeah, keep it going. Rolling. Keep it going. Keeps going. Keep it going. Keeps rolling. Right. So we have two flags. We kill it. And John purposely put defensive half to give you an idea. We don't have a scoring play in progress. Right. We're going to allow that scoring play to continue, right? And again, it's we're gonna say a scoring play versus imminent because that idea is if that player is running down on a fast break and that second flag occurs, allow that fast break to more Mississippi to keep going, right? Because we don't wanna disadvantage at the high school level because the player is gonna throw an extra slash within that. Allow that play to continue. I say, as soon as they go veer away from goal, our play is over. They have to be continually going from goal when that flag is down and continue that play in one kind of seamless flow, if that makes sense. NCAA, we keep going until that shot clock runs out. We keep going, and the shot clock could reset if it hits a post. We've seen that. All right, number seven, mm -hmm. A1 stick is 39 inches, <clears throat> both illegal. Look, and okay. FHS, what's the penalty? NCAA, what's the penalty? Federation is two minutes, locked in. two minutes locked in. NCAA, yeah. three minutes locked in. Three minutes. And what do we do with the stick in NCAA? Where does it have to go? Stays there. Just stays at the table. Goes at the table. And NFHS, when can, and where does it go? They can stretch it out and come back with it. Put it in the stick. <laughs> it goes back to the kid, I guess. Yeah. It goes yeah. back to the kid immediately, and they can start fixing it immediately, right? So <laughs> we have to get that in our brains. I'm considering myself in the old school at this point now, too. Get it out of your brains, right, is give them that stick back immediately. They can start fixing it. And as you said, if they need to pull that stick an extra inch long or put some wood glue on it over the next two minutes. With an so end cap. With an end cap. <laughs> yeah, so be it. Just put a couple, you know, tape and everything else into it. Yeah. So, so again, hey, they Rob, can have that stick back. Yes. Question. Uh, with a deep pocket, a deep pocket penalty, can the player, while they are in the penalty area, can he work on his stick? Yeah. Yeah. Right? He can. 
He can. He can. Right. And it can now go. And that was the point is at the table is that you couldn't have an assistant coach work on it even. Right. Cause the point was it was illegal. You then lose it. Right. They can work on it. It can leave that area as well. Right. Technically that player in the table area needs to be fully equipped. So you need to hand them a different stick. Right. Do not check that stick again. <laughs> like if it gets swapped. Right. But again, he technically needs another stick and then the assistant can go work on it. And that's mm -hmm. fine. I also would consider that a minnow. Don't go chasing after that kid. Right. 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 If, if coach yeah. is doing it. But yeah, they can start working on it right away. And that's okay. by rule. That's totally fine. So, so again, yeah, it's just. Yeah. I just the, the clarification was in the NCA in all those stick problems. Does the stick have to stay at the table? In the no. NCAA, it's at the table, except mm. the only difference is in the D pocket, then it can go to the bench and be fixed, okay. right? During the fine. penalty. During no, the penalty. It's got, to, it's got to stay at, right, John? It's got to stay at the table during the penalty time, and right. then it can go, I thought. Right. John's going to triple check. I don't know if that's true. That might could be also be urban I, legend I, at this point. I mean, basically, he can't use the stick for his penalty time, but I don't see why they can't adjust the stick during the penalty time. Because mm, it's supposed to, stay at, supposed to stay at the table. I think it's supposed to still stay at the table, right? Stays at the table for the duration of the penalty, John. And then they can fix yeah. it. Yeah. 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 yeah, and I think the point is, is that you can't come running back in the game immediately with that stick, hoping that it's fixed, and then obviously it's not, and then you go from there. And I think that came from right when guys would have fully altered sticks, right? And then it was more the you're gaining such a massive advantage. They don't want you running right back on the field pretending that you fixed it and then you got it again. Mm. All right. As John looks. Let me see here. Um, mm. All right. You look at that. We'll go to eight. Should be fairly simple. Team A goes up by 12 goals in the second half. In the second half. And NFHS, what happens? Run time. School. Probably scores again. <laughs> How long does <laughs> good, good answer? Good answer. What happens for the entire second half as soon as we hit that 12 goal differential? Running, runs, running time runs the whole time, including, including, the, JV including, including the JV game. Off. Including the JV. Keep it moving. Keep it moving. Right. Keep it moving. In NCAA, what happens? Nothing. Just Nothing. play the game. We just keep playing. Timeouts. We stop the clock. Correct. Cor correct. Officials timeouts, team timeouts, injuries, which are officials timeouts in my regard. Period mm. ends. Obviously, stop the clock. Okay. So on the illegal cross, I'm not seeing anything that says that the stick mm. for one minute has to stay at the table for the full minute. It it just says that if it's illegal for any other reason than a deep pocket. It's three minute non releasable, and the cross will remain in the table area for the remainder of the game. So I don't see anything under the illegal cross section that says it has to stay there for the full minute, but there may be somewhere else that it has that I've missed. The language actually is absent, uh, John. The, the language has always been absent, but the presumption had been, or if you want to say tradition had been, that the stick stays at the table until the end of the penalty. And if it was an illegal stick that was a three-minute penalty, it stays. Well, it's sort of torn up, burned, you know, that kind of thing. It stays at the table until the end of the game. So um, more, you know, if this is the Midwest, we'd have to look for a clarification and a rule change. <laughs> and Urban legend. I like it. That's what I said. That's I just always thought it just stayed there. Yeah, I showed up a little late here. Rob, did you guys talk about the the stick and the holes? The, the whole thing that is a very good. Yeah, I can do that, and then we'll kind of end the recording. And then if anybody else has got something after, that's a really good point. Out one of the questions that got brought up a little bit odd, but you might we might see it right. Is there was to the similar urban legend kind of idea a few years ago when they said the. <clears throat> Um, stick the mesh need to be fully attached to the stick. The idea was that every sidewall hole, I actually don't have a stick near me, which is odd. Um, every sidewall hole needed to be filled to require that rule. And so that is incorrect. Essentially, as long as it is fully attached to all four sidewalls, the throat, the two sidewalls, and the, the throat, uh, excuse me, the scoop, that is all four walls were good. And then there cannot be gaps in that sidewall that are larger than a golf ball. And they picked a golf ball because most of us can pick out a golf ball size without knowing what a golf ball size actually is, right? Is we just have a common size in our head, even if we don't know the exact, and we'd say that big, right? And that's it. 
And so that's the idea is as long as we don't have that size hole, we're good. But every sidewall hole doesn't actually have to be used, especially if the manufacturer has more holes than is needed by rule. That was a good question. Al had that in the scrimmage yesterday along with John um, and the other guys. Um, good question on that one. And then that originated. And then this year they qualified to make it that gap measurement, if that now makes sense. So it was, it had to be fully attached because guys were only using two or three walls or not all four, right? And now it's back to, as long as it's on all four, it's permanently attached with something usually in nylon, we could use rawhide or leather or different things like that. Um, but it can't be larger than a golf ball size hole. Sound good? All right, I'll stop recording.